One of the things that makes us human is called apophenia, the tendency to see patterns in events or information that only we can see. For people who listen to music, it's a necessity. That's what draws either the emotional or intellectual subtext out of the piece and lets us appreciate it. Or it allows us to take abstruse lyrical concepts from text on page and fashion meaning from them. The latest craze in apophenia, driven by social media and the attendant sense of self-importance that it tends to give individuals and marginalised groups, is called queer coding. That is, in short, the constant draw by LGBTQ2S plus people through texts in popular culture to look for validating messages, messages which offend against the marginalised group, or any information that may reveal a person usually thought to be cisgendered as in fact being queer or queer sympathetic. And I can say with some confidence that few artists are as rigorously and imaginatively checked for queer references as is Taylor Swift. Given that Ms Swift has a new album out, the queer coding industry has been in overdrive, poring over her new songs, looking for queer coding in the record. Thus, we are introduced to the murky, confusing and intellectually unaccountable world of the hashtag gay laws, a hardcore subset of so-called fans who are convinced that Swift manifests an LGBTQIA2S plus identity. The rush to find this validation is a separate process from criticising the album on its merits within the popular music canon. This immediate difficulty that I find is that in doing so I lack the cognitive biases to form apophenic experiences. I can't see LGBTQIA2S plus patterns because I don't know what I'm looking at. The other immediate difficulty is that in spite of myself and after a lot of listens, I quite like this record. It's everything you'd hope a Taylor Swift album would be, a few bangers, a maturing personal perspective to the songs and the odd baffling clunker thrown in. I just find it difficult to deconstruct it as anything but this. So over the course of the review there may be some musings on the supposed queer codes that I've come across in various websites and how that violates the rules of good criticism, but I'm not going to pick apart the fantastical and fatuous arguments ventured by the hashtag gay laws in their lyrical equivalent of tassiography for every song. Track one side one is Lavender Haze. This song is the perfect example of the tenacity, desperation and paucity of intellectual critique in the hashtag gay law community. Lindsay Lee Wallace writing in Extra Magazine states from the get-goes, Midnights may not be explicitly queer, but trust that the gays will mine our own meanings. And with this, proceeds to declare that in spite of Swift's direct confrontation denying any gay subtext in the song, laying it squarely at the feet of her six-year boyfriend, Joe Alwyn, the song is about a couple who are realising they're both bisexual and try to adapt their relationship to this realisation. There's no textual reading that implies this, it's just Wallace either looking to fill a word quota for the article, or stating a fervent personal fantasy and calling it her truth. Of course, the word lavender does have unfortunate associations with the 1950 lavender scare, in which the US government threatened to purge the civil service of all gays. Whether or not this was any more than bully talk is the matter for some debate. And the first openly gay country artist was one Lavender County. But Wallace makes no distinction about this, probably because Swift's desire to stay in the lavender haze contradicts her Taylor gayness thingy. Meanwhile, here in the real world, the song is a solid 1989-style bop and an up-tempo, lazily optimistic way to kick off the album. Its big problem, like most of the rest of the record, is that the production lacks life and punch and the instrumentation has no leads to speak of. Maroon is one of a generation of songs that first came to notice on Lover, where Swift starts to assume a degree of personal responsibility for her situation and the circumstances in which she finds herself. This emerging new focus was of course toxic to the hardcore Swifties, who believe Taylor suffered to validate their own blameless victimhood, but I digress. Of all the songs in the albums, this is a song that grew on me most from first listen to last. It's a very intimate song and is one of the few where the murky bare-boned production actually enhances the song. 
Swift plays with multiple melodic themes here to keep the song moving along, and the story of her relationship complicated by overthinking, unequal levels of power, interfering friends, clouded by his acts of performative feminism, and the further the relationship goes from its days of grace, the darker the shade of red images become. Rosé, burgundy, scarlet, ruby, maroon. My only complaint about the song is that it really would have served better as the album closer, and Karma should be booted up to side two, track one. The argument for the queer subtext here is bewilderingly simplistic, naive and flimsy, whereas the argument for heteronormativity is compelling, pattern-based and robust, because the former is based on changing everything and the latter on precedent and Occam's razor. The hashtag gay laws argument is the Ricky don't lose that number defense, where the song doesn't say Ricky is a girl, so why should they be a girl? Rolling Stone magazine applies the same logic for the opposite outcome. And if you have Rolling Stone arguing your case, you've already lost. What counters it is that while Steely Dan are deeply subversive, Swift is, or so she says, compulsively honest. I think this is a case of nine albums of manifest relationships based in heteronormativity, providing more clear context than any hashtag gay law wishy thinky. Antihero. Straight up banger. The earworm of 2022. I walk around the house singing this constantly and compulsively. It's a little over clever in the lyric department, trying to jam the odd too many syllables into lines, but it's funny, perky, a little self-mocking, and a throwback for the Swifty lifers who want and expect a little self-pity. But it's what she does best. Supreme, self-embedding pop song and every Taylor Swift record, no matter how seriously she may want you to take her as an artist, needs a song like this. The real controversy here is that the video for the song directed by Swift is almost a shot for shot, motif for motif cut and paster from indie artist Manuela's visual EP Glimmers, right down to the arrangement of food on the breakfast plate. As for the queer subtext, well there's Nothing I could find that didn't rise above the level of negotiated constructivism and confirmation biases. Uh, I guess such things happen when we give liberal arts majors a Spotify account. Snow on the Beach. The weakest song on the album, Swift barely seems interested in this, breathing it out in a wispy French fashion model's voice and cursing the brief moment of charity which saw her agree to have the egregious Lana Del Rey appear on the record. Full of gratuitous and unnecessary F-bombs, it's one that could easily have made way for one of the bonus tracks. The hashtag gay law argument is fundamentally the same as for Maroon. If you imagine the song to be about two women, then it is but you have to be determined to write your own narrative at the total exclusion of precedent, evidence, or heteronormative frames. Side one, track five, You're On Your Own, Kid. The best song on the album, in my opinion, where Swift lays out the relationship beautifully and takes control of both the narrative and the outcomes of the relationship. The line about, I hosted parties, I starved my body, hits especially hard. Gone are the junior high school heartbreak essays and gone are the 25 year old's anthems to the invincibility of ignorance. This is the work of a mature woman, a mature artist who has honed her art to this purpose. Even the hashtag gay laws leave this one alone. Perhaps there's hope for them yet. Midnight Rain. It's a shame that after the triumph of You're On Your Own Kid we've got such a weak song. It reads like a 15 year old's poetry. The production is murky and musically it's exactly the same as Antihero. Swift tends to use a set of circular chord patterns all built around tonic subdominant dominant, the old 145 pattern or the three chord trick. Plus she will throw in the relative minor chord. There are about 10 different variations on this pattern. Dave Bennett's piano channel on YouTube has an excellent video on this and he is a first rate presenter. And both Midnight Rain and Antihero use a 4th, 1st, 5th minor. The 4th creating a sense of anticipation because it requires resolution. The 1 resolving it because it's the home chord in the key. The V making the logical harmonic extension. And the minor then darkens the patterns making it sound uncertain until the 4 at the top end of the cycle gets things moving again. She also uses this same chord pattern on uh, We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together and Bad Blood from 1989. 
It would be nice to see Swift put herself into areas where her compositional chops are a little more thoroughly challenged, but let's face it, she and her people knows what sells and they're sticking to their knitting and counting their money. To quote a hashtag Gaylord discussion group, Midnight Rain zooms in on the complicated feelings for the platonically loving, safe, utterly unsatisfying heterosexual relationship you left behind. Oi. Question. The song that had the hashtag gay laws in a fizzy tiz, they say it's about a couple who realise, conveniently, that they're both bisexual and can't now, knowing this, realise their higher selves in the face of repressive heterosexual gender norms and relationships expectations they've steeped in for so long. Rolling Stone magazine doubles down on this, describing it as unquestionably gay, being a queer-sided narrative about homophobia becoming acceptance. Well, if you like, but again, here in the real world, what we have is a catty little song aimed at a long-gone lover asking him if he has buyer's remorse from his new relationship. He's using drugs, she's drinking too much, and that's just to avoid issues of politics and gender roles that they are too consumed with one another to pay any attention to. But as is Taylor's won't, she's soon enough back in victim mode, probing her erstwhile inner amarato as to if he finds his new love as memorable and as satisfying as her. It's grist for the Swifties' mill, but on this record it sounds like a song left over with good reason from, say, Reputation. Vigilante shit. Another song that sounds like a 1989 slash Reputation holdover. Vigilante shit is a joyless car crash of wordplay that mines the Taylor Swift a woman wronged trope for all it's worth. Compared to the best she can offer on this record, this is just more Swifty bait and an exercise in show you nothing, take you nowhere songwriting. The hashtag gay laws seem very focused on the line about her not dressing for women and not dressing for men as some kind of tacit transsexual fantasy or acknowledgement of allyship instead of, you know, the actual context of the lyric. The line, picture me thick as thieves with your ex-wife was also hashtag gay law bait of the highest order. Common sense in a reading of a lyric shows it for what it is, but some people, you just can't unstupid. Getting towards the end now with Bejeweled. Another throwback. Swift says she wrote it to pump herself up for a return to making pop music after she described, somewhat pretentiously, as years of writing folk songs without realising you don't write a folk song. A song becomes a folk song independent of its author. Bejeweled is a by-the-numbers Swift pop song. It's channeling of the vibe of, say, 22 from 1989 or even the collective princess syndrome of the original Swifties. As a record, it's fair, the bridge is interesting, otherwise it's nothing great and her vocals leave a little to be desired. But you wouldn't change the station if it came on. Rolling Stone magazine, intellectual and cultural titans that they are, claim this song is Swift's coming out song because she sings of, get this, this is real, actual, paid money for journalism, sapphire tears on her face and sapphire sounds like sapphic. I swear to God, they actually say that. Labyrinth. This sounds like Snow on the Beach gone slightly less wrong or slightly more right. Like Snow on the Beach, it does break up the flow of the album as it rolls towards home. The ethereal laying of synth, bips and boops make it hard to hear Swift's under-recorded voice. It's not the worst song on the album, but she did leave better songs off the record. So it's difficult to get a hook into, even though the hashtag Gaylors have no interest in reclaiming it. 11. Karma Karma is a recurring theme in Swift songs. Bad blood, look what you made me do, my tears ricochet all too well, et al. Swift is a phenomenal holder of grudges. She is hubris awaiting nemesis. She is Heathcliff traipsing the dark stormy fells of her insatiable self-loathing. No vengeance slakes her thirst for it. No number of injuries and slights, either real or imagined, will request. No aggression is too micro for her to forgo her all-encompassing wrath. And all the while she, as the wounded party, is the morally superior one simply because she is wounded, not for her ability to forgive and transcend. This is the bitter pill of karma, although the upside of the pill is wrapped in a honeyed sweetmeat of bobby melody, a clear punchy vocal, and some cutting catty wordplay. This is what she does best, better than anyone right now, 
In the so far high point of hashtag gay law adulpatedness, one commenter at advocate.com, whose name I've forgotten and frankly didn't interest me much anyway, says that at 232 Swift sings Karma is my girlfriend. No, she doesn't. Clean the wax out of your ears, you buffoon. She clearly says her boyfriend, and the backing vocal is so buried in the mix you can't tell what it says. Says the advocate, you tell me, am I imagining this or did Swift just come out as bisexual? I'm speechless. On the whole, it's better you remain speechless. Trust me. Sweet Nothing. The warmest and most domestic song on the album. This is a sincere-seeming and sweet-natured song either about the protective shell and lack of expectation Joe Alwyn casts around Swift, who appears to be reassessing the pressures and fake assery of the business she's chosen to be in, or her gravely ill mother, to whom she is inordinately close and was one of the prime authors of the Taylor narrative. This is unlikely, however, given the reference to Wicklow, where she and Joe Alwyn holidayed in 2021. Of course, the irony of such meditations in the face of her planning to undertake probably the most in-demand tour in history is telling, but it's a nice song and a pleasant change that probably could have served better sequenced a little sooner. The hashtag Gaylor Chorus is conspicuous in its silence around this song. Finally, Mastermind. This is a tight little song. Swift's melodic gifts are up front and a relatively static arrangement helps her keep a sense of drive and movement in her vocal. The bridge is weird, a mini pity party in the middle of what is a song about empowerment and action. It's short, it's punchy, and it sort of loops back to 2008's love story, with its images of aligned and crossed stars carrying forward the pseudo-Shakespearean theme. Swift has to remember, of course, that if she's going to delve into Romeo and Juliet, she has to bear in mind Act 2, Scene 6. These violent delights have violent ends, and in their triumph die like fire and powder which, as they kiss, consume. The hashtag gay laws on Extra Magazine seem to think the meaning of this song lies in the bridge, which reveals that in addition to a general stupidity and a belief that any of Swift's work exists with only that piece as a frame of reference, there are deep wells of self-loathing in this community. I believe even my inadequacy as a critic crushes their completely non-critical approach, an approach which gathers whatever it can wring from a text, even if it isn't in the text, to validate a pre-assumed outcome. Taylor Swift tries hard and she hits more often than she misses. She is one step short, one tiny step short of being considered an elite artist and I believe strongly she will take that step if she can cut out the static of other people's expectations. The hashtag gay laws, it turns out, are just a stupid and needless distraction. The kind of losers the internet spits out from time to time, parasitically seeking validation in a world where only their opinion matters and given they exist in an echo chamber, their opinion is all they will ever hear. As for Midnight's, it's a good, approaching, very good album. A solid 7.5 out of 10 if you like. Check it out though and make up your own mind, especially if you are a rockist who is still sceptical of Swift.